So welcome everybody here and at home. So our our topic tonight is more or less the French and Indian War, but I want to put it in a larger context of World War. So you see on this chart here, we have three wars that have both a Europe, uh, well more than three, but they have a European name and they have an American name. So the American names are basically based here, these three, of who the king or queen in England is. But in Europe, they have a whole other name too. Um, so that just reminds us that when we're members of the British Empire, which we were in the early days, we were pretty oriented to who the kings and queens were of Britain. So when we have these wars, we reference the, the king or queen of Britain. But in Europe, the uh, three wars you see here, League of Augsburg, Spanish Succession, Austrian Succession, all of these had to do with the French. And Louis XIV, who was the, the big king of France in the 1600s and so on, he was always going to war with his neighbors. So in these three wars, it's either the British or the Dutch or the Spanish or the Austrians, Hungarians. They're either fighting against the French or with the French, depending on what's going on at the time. So that makes uh, studying this part of American history kind of hard because a lot of these wars have the two names. They have the American name and then they have the European name. They're the same war, but they have a different name because of where they were. And then I just thought I'd throw this in here too. So we have our Revolutionary War, um, the French Revolution, which led to Napoleon, all of Europe was at war. And then of course we have World Wars I and II, which, which you guys know about. But I think a lot of people are surprised by the fact that prior to World Wars I and II, there were in fact many world wars. Um, and what's going on in our talk tonight is part of that larger context. So here's kind of the timeline for tonight. So in 1598, we have the Edict of Nantes. That was when Louis XIV gave religious freedom to French Protestants, known as Huguenots. And soon after that, Champlain went to Quebec. Because our, our big issue today is the British and the French are fighting each other. And then we have Louis XIV becoming king. He's, he rules for about 60 years. And most of the time, he's going to war with his neighbors. Then we have La Salle going down the Mississippi. Then we have all these different wars that I told you about. King William's War, Queen Anne's War, King George's War. We have the French founding New Orleans. So here's a kind of a fun fact, you know. So if you start in a certain town and then you move, you might name it New something. So for instance, in Massachusetts, there's a Boston and there's a New Boston. There's a Salem and there's a New Salem. There's a Braintree and there's a New Braintree, and so on and so forth. So Orleans, of course, is south of Paris. That's where Joan of Arc was from. So now you have New Orleans. So that reminds us that that was a French city. Here's the War of Jenkins Ear, which we talked about. And then this is what uh, surprises people. In 1754, people forget that George Washington wore a red coat. Right? George fought for the British Army in his early days. And then this is the war we're really going to focus on tonight, the French and Indian War. Then Braddock was a British general. He had some ideas for fighting the French, but they weren't very good. Then the Brits get a new prime minister. This is the big W for Britain, up on the plains of Abraham and Quebec. Peace of Paris ends the war with the French. Britain wins. And also the same year you have an Indian war and you have the British trying to keep people from moving across the Appalachian Mountains. So from 1598 to 1763, about so 170 years, that's roughly our time frame for tonight. Okay, so let's get into it. So if we could look at the map at 1700, you've got English are clinging to 
the eastern seaboard. They've got a little bit of influence right here. Then you've got the French have settled the dark green, but notice French influence. All of this, it's huge. So if things had gone a different way, we might all be parlaying Francais today, but we'll speak in English instead. And then what people forget is you've got the Spanish here and here, and then this is disputed up here and up here. So in 1700, it's anybody's game what's going to happen in North America. And one theme I think is really important in history is nothing in that is inevitable. When something happens, we tend to think that it was bound to happen. That's kind of how we, we look at things. But if you could go back to the year 1700 and say to people, you know, North America is eventually going to be all English speakers, they'd say, really? Because if you look at the map, the people who had most of the property were the French and the Spanish. The Brits are just hanging on by their fingernails. Um, on the East Coast. Now, this is a cool photograph. This is of a little, little town in France. This is where Samuel de Champlain was born. It's called Brouage, I think. And you'll notice, here's the Atlantic Ocean, and here's his town, and it's a perfect walled city with the, the six-star ramparts. So when Samuel de Champlain was a kid, this was all water. This has all been filled in since the 1600s. So when Champlain was a little boy, his whole orientation was toward the ocean. Here's a fun fact about Champlain. He sailed back, back and forth across the Atlantic over 20 times at four months a crack. You do the math. That means he's on a boat for years, going back and forth between Paris, uh, France and the New World. So there's actually a street named after him in this little town. So he's born in Brouage in the year 1570. He founds Quebec in 1608. And he goes on lots of voyages for about the next 30 years. He dies in 1633 in Quebec but nobody knows where his body is. So if you go to old Quebec City, you, there's a statue of Samuel de Champlain right there, but they're not sure if his body is underneath there. They think it might be, but nobody knows for sure. All right, this is a great picture. So it's called Champlain's First Battle with the Indians, 1609. So if you look at it, you see the Indians here, and they're all scrunched together. And then you see some Indians here, they're all scrunched together. You see two Europeans. You see a guy right here with a gun. And then you see another guy right here with a gun. We're pretty sure this is Champlain. We're pretty sure it's in New York State. So one of the things about Samuel Champlain that's fascinating is he wanted to live with the Indians in peace. And he was very intent about that. He's very intentional about that. But uh, he did have alliances with various Indians that helped him. And the story is one day he and the Indians that he knew were sort of out doing their thing and they came across another group of and it just so happened that the Europeans had these, um, these old kind of guns that you'd have a crank. Maybe you've seen those in the movies. And they took forever to load and so on and so forth, but they made a really big noise and they were really lethal. So Champlain gets in front of his group and does the first shot against the Indians. While one of his, uh, there are two of them actually, are here doing a side volley. And the, as far as we can tell, they only shot those guns about two or three times, but that was enough to subdue these guys. So I'm putting this up here partly because it's a really good story, but it's partly that right away in the relationships between the French and the British, it's who allies with which Indian tribe. That's absolutely crucial to this story. 
And that's why the war we're going to talk about later is called the French and Indian War, because the French had their allies and the British had their allies. But it all began, or not all begins, but one beginning of it, Champlain. And he didn't want to do this, by the way. His vision was not to go to war with the Indian people, but that's what happened. So one of the stereotypes we have of the French uh, explorers, the voyageurs, right? They're in these long canoes and they're going all over the place. Maybe you've seen the movie Black Robe or some of those other movies. And what's really fascinating is not only how much territory the French covered, but their legacy. So just a quick look at all the French names that we have in our country. So you have um, Baton Rouge, which means red stick in French. Louisiana, of course, is named after Louis, the king. Um, New Orleans, I talked about before. And then Detroit comes from a French word. Uh, Montreal, of course, is French. Three Rivers in French. Michelinacinac, Mackinac was French. Fort Duquesne, which I'm going to talk about later, that becomes Pittsburgh. So if you looked at this map, you would probably assume the French we're going to dominate North America because they had the land. And that's part of the uh, fun part of traveling the whole Mississippi Valley today as you see all these French names all over the place. Yeah, it's great. So here's a subgroup of French, it's the Huguenots. So Huguenots are French Protestants. France is primarily a Roman Catholic country. Um, by the way, the French law is no woman can ever be in charge. You have to have a man. You can't have a queen like in England. You have to have a man. Uh, that's, that has a long story to it. So some of the Huguenots, um, they lived in Paris. Many of them, they lived in other parts of France too. And there was always a sort of love-hate relationship between the French rulers and the Huguenots after the Reformation started. One of the kings, Louis XIV, or Louis XII, I mean, or Henry IV, sorry. Henry IV himself was a Huguenot. He was a French Protestant. And he had passed a law giving religious freedom to the Huguenots. But then Louis XIV took that away, and a lot of the French Huguenots left France. They went to the Netherlands, which is a Protestant country, and they went to England. So when the English start moving to the New World, you have a lot of French names who were Protestants. For instance, who went to the Huguenot Fort in Oxford. Isn't that cool up there on Fort Hill Road? There's a Huguenot Road, too. Mm -hmm. So there, you must have been there. No, well, you got to go. It's right by Home Depot. Yeah. Huh. Okay. So you go up like to Market Basket and go up Fort Hill Road. Okay. And then off on the left is this place where the Huguenot Fort used to be. Huguenots, there were a lot of Huguenots in South Africa, too. Well, the Dutch connection. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So I commend all of you watching at home, go to Huguenot Hill <laughs> in Oxford. It's really cool. And the legacy of the Huguenots is long and deep. Uh, one of them is Peter Faneuil. This is Faneuil Hall. He was a Huguenot. So he was a French Protestant. Um, Paul Revere was a Huguenot, or he came from a Huguenot family. So Revere is a French name, right? So there's Paul Revere, great American. And just an example of a French name, New Rochelle, which is a metro New York City, La Rochelle was the city in France where the Huguenots were concentrated on the coast near Bordeaux. So when the Huguenots moved to Metro New York, they named it New Rochelle. So that would be a fun topic to look into is just Huguenot um, influence in the United States. But why did everybody want to come to the New World? Well, this was one of the reasons was to trap beaver. Yep. It's a huge, yeah, it's a huge story, and um, when we get to American history in, say, 1820s, 1830s, I'm going to talk a lot about the fur trappers out in the Rocky Mountains. 
but people loved the beaver, and the number one use of the beaver was the beaver hat. So when the, the mountain man era ends around 1840, 1850, one of the reasons it ends is they killed every beaver in the Rocky Mountains that they could find. But another one was fashions had changed and beaver hats were moving out of style. But one of the reasons these people did all this voyaging and all this canoeing was to kill beaver and sell these hats in Europe for a, a good profit. I think you stopped wearing a beaver hat, didn't you, Justin? <laughs> Just recently, yeah. Now, of all these different wars, Queen Anne's War, King George's War, and so on, it did affect the colonies. And if you've been to Deerfield, Mass., you've maybe seen this marker of uh, Massachusetts people who were killed by the Indians as part of all these wars that were going on. Now, the date, though, is the tip-off. This is 1704. This is about 50 years before the French and Indian War. So if... People came to Massachusetts in 1620, 1630. This is within the lifetime of, of one person, say, who was born in 1630. At the end, the early 1700s, they were at war with the Indians. And many times the Indians were allied with the French. So this is part of that, that background. Another one of the many wars that we had was in six, uh, 1754, 1745, excuse me. And I think this is such a cool story. So everybody here in the East Coast, they're British citizens. They're not Americans. They're English. And the French had a fort way over here called Fort Louisburg, named after Louis. Okay. So the British were in Boston. And they said to some of the Massachusetts people, we need you guys to help us go attack Fort Lewisburg. And they did. It's really a great story. So all these ships left Boston. They sailed up to Fort Lewisburg. They besieged it and were victorious. And that's what Fort Lewisburg looks like today. I've never been. It's on my life list to visit. But it's one of those traditional forts with the angles and so on. And the, um, the Massachusetts people were so proud of themselves that they had helped the empire that when they came back to Boston and they had all their celebrations and so on, they named one of the squares on Beacon Hill after this, Lewisburg Square. It's still there today. Here it is. So I, I think Lewisburg Square in Boston is right on Mount Vernon Street right next to the common. One of the cool things about Lewisburg Square, it reminds us that for a long time we were all Englishmen in Massachusetts. We, we were loyal to the king. And there are certain streets in Boston that still retain that. Like Lewisburg Square gets its name from the battle that we won as Englishmen. Not as Americans. And anybody know what the main street in the North End is called? It starts with an H. Oh, Hanover. Hanover Street. Where does that come from? Well, probably some prince was from Hanover. Yeah, all the Georges, one, two, three, and four, were all from the House of Hanover, which is German. So even today, as you go into the north end of Boston, there's a street named after a German royal family. All the Georges were Germans. So you still have that legacy in Boston where we were all Englishmen at one point, including Lewisburg Square. Well, what really ticked off the Americans, I'm calling them that, was in the treaty after that particular war, Fort Lewisburg was given back to the French as part of the treaty. And the, the Massachusetts people were really angry about that because they had gone up there to fight. So we're, that's one of the early resentments you start to get between the Massachusetts people and uh, the English. A really good connection of the past is the Boston Common. Well, you know what's really cool about the Boston Common? There are a lot of things cool about it, but the bottom part of the common, where it goes right along Charles Street, was actually the water's edge in 1630. Wow. And there's a little marker there. It says, on this spot, the British boarded their boats to go to Lexington and Concord. Jeez. It's very cool, the common. Yeah. All right, now notice everybody, 1750. So I started off with 1700. 
This is 1750, the King William's War, the Queen Anne's War, those are happening. And you'll notice that the French is still pretty strong. The British is what it is, but you have this disputed area. Basically, the Ohio River Valley where it flows into the Mississippi. Now, one of the real themes in any study of history is the importance of geography. Geography is destiny sometimes. And where the Ohio River flows into the Mississippi, this whole region is very important to this story. Um, the French didn't really have any designs on the seacoast. And the British here didn't really have any designs in what's now Missouri and North Dakota. But this area along the Ohio, that was really crucial because where the Ohio flows into the Mississippi, Mississippi is the key river. Ohio flows into Mississippi. Whoops. Well, I guess that picture didn't come out. So what the French did, Fort Duquesne, they built a fort where the Ohio River begins. Now this map is a little different than today's map. So here you have one river, the Monongahela, and here's another river which they call the Ohio, but we call it the Allegheny. And it's at this point that the Ohio River begins. Anybody been to Pittsburgh? Okay, okay, this is really, this is cool. So the French built a fort here, Fort Duquesne, at the, where those two rivers come together to form the Ohio, because they all realize that whoever controls the Ohio here has big influence on where it flows into the Mississippi later. Now here's Pittsburgh today, and here's Fort Duquesne. It is so cool. So here's the Allegheny, here's the Monongahela, and they joined to form the Ohio. That's why the Pittsburgh Pirates used to play in Three River Stadium, right? Because you got one, two, three. Uh, so this past summer, my wife Dorothy and I were in Pittsburgh um, for a bunch of reasons. One, we'd never been before. But two, I'd done a bit of studying on Washington, and uh, George Washington was involved in the capture of Fort Duquesne. So we wanted to, to see it. Now, can you tell the different rivers by color? Isn't this slick? So this is the Monongahela, which comes from um, kind of southern Pennsylvania and flows north. And then here's the Allegheny that comes in from uh, kind of northern New York State. And you can see the color of the two rivers here. Uh, and it's not because one is polluted, it's because the soils that this one goes through are a lot different than the soils this one's go through. But this is where Fort Duquesne was. This is downtown Pittsburgh. And then the ballparks are right here where the Steelers play and the Pirates and so on. But these are the two rivers that come together. So I'm standing at the center of where Fort Duquesne was. And George Washington was here in 1754. So how cool is that? I commend it to everybody. Go to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so here's George as just a kid. Now, what strikes us about this picture of George Washington? Well, there are a couple things about it. First of all, he's a red coat. He's a British officer. And I think we forget this about Washington, that the early years of his life, he was very loyal to the crown very loyal to the king. He had taken an oath, after all, to be a soldier. So when Washington is involved in the revolution, you know, it would sort of be like somebody like Robert E. Lee, who took an oath to the Constitution fighting for the South. Maybe, not quite the same. But one of the, one of the reasons we think Washington was willing to lead our revolution against the British is he felt um, disrespected by the British. He never really made it to the rank that he thought he should. And the British were very condescending toward all American officers. They thought we were just a bunch of rubes and hicks and that kind of thing. And the story is that Washington really resented that. He, he was sort of touchy about that. 
And when the revolution comes and they ask George to take the lead, he kind of remembered that a little bit, that uh, he, he'd not been respected like he should. But at this stage in the game, there's no American Revolution in the future. There's no him being president. There's no one dollar bill. He's just a loyal soldier. Um, and they do capture Fort Duquesne. But then later they lose another battle and Washington is sort of on the outs for a while. But this is where he uh, gets started. He's a red coat, the French and Indian War. So this is one of these wars that I think we all kind of have kind of a rough idea about that, yeah, it was sort of fought out in the Appalachians. And I think for a lot of people, uh, this is how they know it from this movie. <laughs> We've all seen Last of the Mohicans, right? Daniel Day-Lewis running through the forest there. Um, a lot of that was actually filmed in North Carolina, but it looks like it's in New York. But um, it's if you go up to Lake George today, which is by Lake Champlain, at least when I was there last, there are these big pictures of Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> I am the last of the Mohicans. All right, we associate this with Ben Franklin. And you'll notice, everybody, that there are no separate states here. It's just called New England. And sometimes you see people with these flags. Uh, what the mistake is, though, that this has nothing to do with the revolution. This, this join or die. So when the a war with the French started, the French and Indian War, Benjamin Franklin suggested that people come together in Albany, New York. It's called the Albany Congress. And it was Franklin and others who said, you know, if we're going to be successful in fighting against the French with their Indian allies, we have to work together. And this is where this famous uh, snake image comes from. People often associate this with the revolution, but this predates the revolution by 20 years. It, but, go ahead, you had a question? It kind of looks like somebody took a sword and chopped up the snake in little pieces. It sure does, yeah. All chopped up. So the snake isn't too healthy now, is it? But the seed is starting to be sown here about unity. That, that's why we pay attention to this so much, because... If you could go back to 1754 and say to the people at the Albany Congress, you know, in 25 years you guys are going to be fighting for independence, they'd probably say we are. But many people see the French and Indian War as sort of the beginning of more of a sense of Americans of the, the 13 colonies, not just colonists. So South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, Maryland, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York. So no Delaware in this, right? Okay, what else are we missing? Well, Connecticut, Mass, would all be in New England. All right, we're moving along here. So um, Braddock is the general. He's in charge, and he's got this elaborate plan of fighting the French. So here's Fort Duquesne. That's now Pittsburgh today. Renamed because the British won and they named it after William Pitt, their prime minister. But you'll notice everybody that one of the arrows of the plan is to go toward the Great Lakes here and another is going to go toward Canada. Okay, spoiler. This is also what happens in the War of 1812. Now, we've only had five declared wars in our country's history. War of 1812, War with Mexico, Spanish-American, World War I, World War II. Those are the only five where Congress declared war. And the first one, the War of 1812, roughly is the same map except for this arrow. There's a lot of fighting against the British in Canada, and there's a lot of fighting against the British around Lake Champlain. So what makes this map kind of special is if you go back in time, it's the same area, but this is all French. They're fighting the French. Um, Braddock gets killed, by the way, in the uh, French and Indian War. He wasn't a very good soldier. And there's Fort Lewisburg again, where the Boston people had been before. So this is the big battle in the French and Indian War. Um, this is the Battle of Quebec. You know the story. 
So um, William Pitt had become the prime minister of Britain. And he said, look, we got to we got to get our A game going in here. So the plan was to ferry the troops up to the cliff at night and the Redcoats would scale the cliff and then they would meet the French up here and have this, this big battle. And this is, you know, war in the olden days, if you won one big battle, you won the war. I mean, that's kind of how it worked. So this is what happened. And if you go there today, it's the same. I mean, just look at these two pictures. So that's 1754. Notice the sort of citadel up here. And it's a big hotel now. So you can, you can visit this. It's a big park. And the British lined up and the French lined up. And everybody knew whoever won was going to win the whole enchilada. And the British won. And this is the famous painting, The Death of Wolfe. So here's uh, General Wolfe dying. And you can see all kinds of soldiers and things in the background. This was painted about 20 years after the battle by uh, Benjamin West. There are a lot of things in this painting that really fascinate people. For instance, what's he thinking? Well, nobody knows, right? Um, is he thinking, you know, I'm glad this guy died? Is he thinking, I'm sad this guy died? Is he thinking, what's going to happen to our people after this war? I mean, we don't know. Who's the guy in the green? Not sure, but probably a messenger. But what really fascinates people is that a lot of the guys pictured in this painting weren't even there. These were all identifiable to people who lived at the time. But look at Wolf's face. If you know anything about medieval art or Renaissance art, this is the look of Mary as she's holding the dead Jesus. Or this is the look of a saint as he or she is, you know, about to die. So this idea of Wolf is sort of a Christ figure in a way, because, you know, you see his arms like this. And if you compare the way Wolf is lying here with pictures of Mary holding the dead Jesus, I mean, they're a lot alike. So this idea of art as not just telling the story, but trying to infuse it with some new meaning, this is a great example of that. Like Washington Crossing the Delaware, right? You guys know that painting. That's inaccurate in many ways, but it doesn't need to be accurate. I mean, it needs to make a point, and this does too. I have seen this picture. Yeah, it's quite famous. Um, I'm not sure how accurate it is, though. <laughs> Now, here's another part of the French and Indian War that is, I think, fascinating for American history. So what if you're French and suddenly you lose? What do you do? Well, a lot of the French from Acadia moved down to Louisiana because that was French. And what do we call those people in Louisiana? Cajuns. Cajuns, yes. So that word Cajun is partly related to the word Acadia, which is where a lot of these people came from. And the reason a lot of them went down to Louisiana because that was still French. Um, so that's why where you get that word Cajun. So when the British took over all of Canada, what do you do with all those people who were loyal to the French? Well, you'd kick them out, I guess, or expect them to behave. But that's where Cajuns come from, this time period. All right, now the French and Indian War is over. It's 1763. So I've shown you three maps so far. 1750, um, 1700, 1750, and now 1763. So here we go. You've got the Brits are pretty strong here originally, but look what they gained from the French. This is huge, all because of the Battle of Quebec. You've got the Hudson Bay Company, and when I talk about the, um, the, the fur trade in the 1820s and 1830s, when we get that far, one of the great pioneers of that was, what well, well, was John Jacob Astor was one, a story named after him. But 
you still have this area here. Uh, anybody recall when Louisiana gets added to the country? Louisiana Purchase. Anybody remember that year? Jefferson? Yeah, 1803, yeah. Jefferson. So the Brits are pretty strong here. They've got some ways to go yet. But this is a huge thing for Britain. But notice, everybody, Spanish Florida. Florida is the Spanish word for flower. And this is going to be mostly under John Adams and then later Andrew Jackson. We're going to just sort of take Florida, so, you know, Tom Brady's still in an American city, right, Tampa Bay? I see too many tiny little bit of Oh, down here? Yeah. So things change, don't they? Yeah. What about the Indians, though? So, um, the French and Indian War was pretty hard on the Indians. Now, one of the themes that I've talked about with the other talk, too, is that there was one thing the Indians couldn't really fight against, and that's smallpox, pneumonia, measles. They just didn't have the antibodies for it, and a lot of Indians just died because of that. But when it came to alliances, the Indian tribes that had been allied with the French, they're in deep trouble now that the French have lost. So during this time period, 1763, when the treaty was signed between Britain and France, Pontiac, who was a chief in the Midwest, what we call the Midwest today, what they called the West, had an uprising, and you can see where all these happened. He actually is killed in Canada, I think, in Ontario somewhere. Um, but this is kind of the last gasp of, of the Indian people east of the Mississippi uh, after this, this French and Indian War. And you can see the names of some of these tribes here, yeah. But the end, the end is, uh, is going to be in sight for the Eastern Indians, I think, after this. Yeah, we think of Miami as being in Florida, but the tribe was originally up in Ohio and Indiana. So here's a, so now the Brits, they have a problem. So they don't have to worry about the French. Now they have to worry about their own people, because I mentioned this a month ago. One thing about Americans is we're always on the move. This, this is one of our characteristics as people. So when the war was finished with the French and all of this area became British, so many colonists wanted to move west to the Appalachian Mountains to settle here. And the British said, look, you can't do that. That's occupied by native peoples and so on and so forth. So what the British did in 1763 was they made a proclamation in which they basically said to white America, you cannot go west of this red line, basically the Appalachian Trail today. Well, what do you think the colonists thought about that? They said, forget about it. And this is going to be an ongoing issue all through the 1700s, into the 1800s, people moving here, even though they technically weren't supposed to. And then you get into all kinds of issues of land ownership. For instance, if you're in the modern state of Ohio and somebody is living there, they're going to claim it for their own, even though they don't have a deed. But it's all wilderness out there, so how do you do deeds? So this is going to be a big deal as we get closer to our revolution, is what about all these people moving west of the Appalachian Trail? Kind and, of crossing that line is kind of like trespassing on somebody else's well, backyard. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, westward expansion initially was this kind of westward expansion. It was west of the Appalachians into Ohio or into Tennessee or into Kentucky. I think when we think of Western expansion today, we tend to think of this kind of Western expansion, right? The covered wagons and everybody going out to Wyoming. But it really began earlier when we went across the Appalachians into, um, into that territory. And perhaps the most famous is Daniel Boone. So a couple years ago, my wife and I were in, um, we went to Kentucky. We went to Kentucky for 
bunch of reasons. One was to see where Lincoln was born. I'm a big Abe Lincoln fan. Anybody know the capital, Kentucky? States and capitals? Frankfurt. O-R-T. Frankfurt is the capital. And this is Daniel Boone's grave. He's buried in the cemetery in the capital of Kentucky. And you all know about Boonesboro, right, where he set up a trading post. But see, Daniel Boone was one of these guys who went across the Appalachians when he really wasn't supposed to, according to the British, but he did it anyway. The original Boonesboro is long gone. About a couple down, miles down the road, they have a replica of it that you can visit. It's sort of like Old Sturbridge Village. It's, it's pretty cool. But it's funny, isn't it, though? We, we think of Daniel Boone as one of these great heroes, but if you're running the government and you don't want people to go west to the Appalachian Mountains, he's sort of a troublemaker a little bit. Yeah. I loved Daniel Boone's stories when I was a kid. So here we are. It's kind of the end of the French and Indian War. It's 1763. We've got this red line, which is the uh, kind of the Appalachian Trail. Things are pretty solid here, but things are really unsettled here. And of course, the revolution is going to come and you know, I'll talk about that next time. But I said this last time, too. We tend to think it's sort of inevitable that our country went from sea to shining sea. But if you lived here in the 1780s, and if you had said to somebody, you know, the United States is going to spread all the way to the Pacific, they would have said, well, where's the Pacific? Where is it? Yeah. It's far, far away. So here are a couple questions to think about. So let's take them in order. So, number one, the French, the Spanish, English were all competing with each other in North America. What was the long-term significance associated with the English winning? So I want you, Well, I want you to think about this. If the French had won, what would be different other than that we'd be speaking French? How would our government be different if we were, if the French had won the French and Indian War? Justin? What do you think? I mean, who knows what could have happened in the intervening years. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the Magna Carta wouldn't have played such a big influence in, um, you know, American politics. Um, we'd be modeling our, you know, our society and lifestyle on, you know, um, you know Paris instead of London. Yeah, so a couple of things I think are important. First of all, we historically have been a Protestant country although not as much today. But the French and the Spanish are Catholic. Now, I'm not making a value judgment on that's whether good or bad, but uh, we have historically been Protestant. That would be different. Another awesome. one, though, and we, and we talked, you have a comment? No. Oh, okay. Another <laughs> one, about a month, I think I said this a month ago, is in England they have what's called common law, where the judges make ruling based on sort of historically what's happened at, at the time. Whereas both the French and the Spanish, it's where the law comes from the top down. In English common law, the law comes from the bottom up. Uh, for instance, years ago, my wife and I were in, in France, and uh, we were in Paris, and we saw the French police just kind of really hassling the guy about something. And that's that's fine when you have that sort of top down. Whereas in our country, if, if a cop did that, you'd say, oh, you know, hey buddy, I got my rights, you know. I mean, I'm simplifying, but that's one of the differences between the English and the French or the English and the Spanish is we have that, that common law tradition based on the experiences of communities, whereas the French and the Spanish have kind of the top down. Um, also? Yeah, what would be another one you think? If we are all we might, speaking French or Spanish today. We might have a king. Would that be bad? Maybe. Yeah. So would we have a democracy like we do if we had stayed with the French or the Spanish? Don't know. Well, no. But maybe not, right? Yeah. So that's just one of those what ifs. What if the French had won? Better food. Yeah. Less exactly. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. 
Do they eat French fries in France? No. <laughs> Who knows? All right. Now, here's another one. Why was the Seven Years' War, which was the European name, we call it the French and Indian War, a turning point in the history of British colonial America? Pat, you want to try that one? After the Seven Years' War, how was our relationship with Britain going to be different as Americans? What do you think? I don't know. Okay. Are wars cheap or expensive? Expensive. Very expensive. So when the French and Indian War is finished, the Brits have a big bill. And guess who they want to pay it? Big. Us. So that's why you get all these taxes, like the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, all these things that you remember from studying American history. But see, from the perspective of the Brits, it's, look, we protected you guys during the French and Indian War. Now we want you to help pay for it. So one of the reasons the revolution happens, you know, one of the one of the phrases is taxation without representation is tyranny. So in Parliament they said, look, we, we helped you guys out. Now just pay back. Come on. And then another thing about the French and Indian War, if you think back to that flag of the cut up snake. During the French and Indian War, you start to get a little bit of feeling of American unity, not just colonists. And the very, very fact that Ben Franklin would talk about some kind of unity in the context of the French and Indian War, it's huge. It really is. So the key pieces of evidence would be that after the war is over, the British want us to start paying for it through all those taxes and the evidence of Americans starting to pull together as Americans. And then the last one, in what sense are world wars not a new idea? You want to try that one? Well, because We've had world wars for a long time. Yeah, but I mean, you, you're fighting in different countries. Sometimes it's an ocean apart. Um, I'm trying to, like in World War One and World War Two. I mean, you had people from all over the globe that were colon originally like British colonists or right. French colonists as allies with the quote mother country. Would we all agree that globalization has been happening for a long time? Yeah. International trade that's been going on a long time. Yeah. So I think what what surprises people when they reflect upon this is how in a time when it took three months to cross the Atlantic, which it did, and it took so much time to communicate, you can't you know, call somebody instant like, like you can today, how it was still world war. I think we tend to think because by today's standards, people were pretty isolated. Wars would tend to be more local, but it truly was a global economy even in the 18th century. So this is one reason why these wars become world wars. Uh, what's changed, of course, is the tech, right? Uh, world Wars One and Two were just the, the technology of killing had really increased a lot. But. All right, so that's it for tonight, everybody.